Okay, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Really, really happy to come here and talk about my research. And so my research is in the theory of self-assembly. So at a high level, the goal of this line of research is you're given some nanostructure, maybe a shape, a pattern, maybe a nanoscale device. And your goal is to design a system of molecules, maybe made of DNA or something, uh, design a system of molecules such that were you to make millions of copies of each component in that system you've designed and throw them in a test tube and shake them up, that they would float around, bump it into another stick and grow, and you design them in such a way that they would grow into your goal nanostructure. Okay, so this is a fundamental kind of general class of problems that uh, promises to be um, a fundamental importance to the future of nanotechnology, okay? So I'm a computer scientist, so, uh, and, I, and I design algorithms, that's my area of expertise. So what, how does this fit in with that? If you can think about this, uh, an algorithm designer has a problem. They want to design an algorithm, and when you run it, it will produce some desired output. Here the output is a nanostructure, something you want to build. The program is the system of molecules that you carefully design. That is your molecular algorithm. And running that program is when you throw in the test tube and have them self-assemble, okay? So a lot of the same principles come in. It's like a very strange computer. It's a molecular computer, and that's what we're going for. And uh, I think um, it's true that this is the future of nanotechnology, molecular computation. That's where the real power is. And so I'm going to talk about the theory of that, and we want to develop that theory so we can harness these these uh, the, the power of self-assembling systems. And we're going to focus on an abstract mathematical model of self-assembly where the parts, the monomers in the system are simple square tiles with different colored glues on the sides. The idea is they float about in the plane and bump, and when they match glues, there's an affinity for them to stick together, and that's, how, that's what drives the self-assembly process. Okay. Now this is motivated, first of all, by DNA, this model. These tiles can be implemented with molecules of DNA. I'll talk about that in a second, but let me just kind of go in a little bit more about why we care about uh, understanding self-assembly theory. Again, our idea is to design a system of molecules of DNA, throw them in a test tube, and then pull out a complex circuit that the DNA built for us. So it seems kind of weird and like, no. You know, design a set of molecules, throw in a test tube, and a zebra jumps out, okay? Uh, <laughs> So it's a, kind of a weird type of problem. You might think, oh, that's crazy, but it's a little less crazy when you think of that that's exactly what nature does. We're all these amazingly complex, in fact, the most complex machines we've seen in the known universe, all of us are built in exactly that way. You inject a bunch of DNA into this bag of molecules, a cell, and that encode, that program, grows into a human, it grows me, it grows, says, I know I grow a hand here, I know to grow a heart here, I know to grow a brain here. The ability of those molecules through self-assembly to figure that out um, is amazing, and the idea is we want to harness that power to control molecules and design them to build the things we want them to build, okay? So that's kind of, uh, that's what we want to do. We understand this theory, we know it's powerful. There's many proofs of concept, we're just walking around. So we want to understand this technology and use it to do something. So. Motivating this, this model, this abstract tile self-assembly model, um, is the fact that you can implement these things with the DNA. So here we have, this is a, an AMF picture of an experiment. So this is an actual atomic force microscope picture of a blob of DNA. It's not really. Okay. <laughs> um, this is, conceptually, you have a blob of DNA and it has four unbonded sticky strands of DNA sticking out the side. And the idea is you encode in those four strands the four different glues of the tile. And so when you want two tiles to stick together, you create the corresponding blobs to be such that their two west and east blondes, respectively, are Watson Crick complements and other. So it drives the two blob tiles to attach along that glue. Yeah. Like that. Now, a little more realistically, the way this is actually implemented, uh, one of the implementations is Holiday Junction, where you have four strands of DNA stuck together in this fashion, and you can kind of see that there's a little overhang, and those are the four un sticky, unhybridized strands sticking out of the four sides of this DNA tile, and that's a, a more conceptual picture up there on the left. And then they can come together and stick and grow this 2D lattice, just like the tiles are supposed to. So the idea is the way we study these 2D tiles is because we can build these with molecules of DNA and make them act like 
the abstract model does, essentially. OK, and there's actually many different implementations of these DNS tiles. It's a very hot topic right now. And these are all actual, I'm not joking this time, real AFM images of actual DNA tiles and DNA lattices built you know, on the order of you know, a handful of nanometers. So, all right, so now our abstract problem is uh, this. And this is what we're going to focus on. We're just going to do a real simply stated problem that has a surprisingly deep solution. That's what we're going to focus on. We don't have much time. The general problem is given an input shape like that, our goal is to design a set of these tiles such that when you throw them in and let them bounce together, infinite copies of each type, they uniquely grow into that shape and then stop growing, can't grow anymore. That's our goal. And then we say that system will self-assemble that shape. Okay, that's where and we ask ourselves some questions like, okay, how efficiently can I build that shape? So oh, I mean, I can build it, but how well can you build it? And the metric we're going to focus on is to build a target shape, I want to build it with the smallest number of distinct particles I can. So if I can build the shape with fewer distinct tile types than you can, then I have a better solution. That's how we're going to measure our efficiency. That makes sense? OK. So in this talk, we're going to focus on two very simple class of examples. We're going to self-assemble rectangles and squares. And that's all we have time for right now. But as simple as these shapes are to define a surprisingly deep solution. We're going to talk about that now. OK. So a little background self-assembly. Now we're going to formally tell you what the model is, how this tile self-assembly model works. And then we're going to move on to our two examples, squares and rectangles. Okay. So first of all, this tile self-assembly model. Uh, formally, there's some math, but here's the idea. This is a tile system. It consists of a set of tile types up there. There's six of them. And each glue, all these different colors, are assigned a strength, an integer strength. So some of them have strength 2, some of them have strength 1. Okay. And then there's this parameter T called the temperature of the system, 2 in this case. And what that says is to, for things to come together and stick, they have to have at least a strength 2 or greater uh, bond. Otherwise, it's just you know, the temperature is too high for them to stick. That makes sense? Okay. So got these tiles. We've got the strength of the glues. And we have this threshold that they need to overcome to stick together. Now, the way self-assembly starts is one of these tiles is known as the seeds, kind of the starting point. And we say, imagine infinite copies of all those guys in the tile set floating around, bumping into the seed. And if they have enough strength, they'll stick. So one thing that could happen is uh, that tie could bump into the seed. And yellow has strength 2. That meets or exceeds the temperature of 2. So that could stick. C could stick, because red also has strength 2. And so could D and B, because green and blue have strength 2. Okay? Now, uh, the white and pink blue each only have strength 1, which is not enough on its own. But once we have this corner built, this guy can go here because it gets 1 from both the pink and the white for a total of strength 2. So you get this cooperative binding effect, which turns out to be a very powerful um, powerful aspect of this model that allows us to do very tricky stuff. Okay. And remember, we have infinite copies of all these guys. So the x can now also go here, here, and here. And it can't keep growing because, again, pink or white alone are not enough. So you can see nothing else can attach to this. So it stops growing. So this would constitute a solution to the problem of building a 3 by 3 square. So OK, let's build a 3 by 3 square. This is a solution. And what's its efficiency? By our definition, this is a six tile solution. Okay, So we can build a 3 by 3 square with six tiles. Now you can ask yourself, OK, can we do it with five? Can we do it with four? What's the, what's the true complexity? Can we beat this solution? More generally, we're going to ask asymptotically for very big n by n square, 100 by 100, 1,000 by 1,000 square. What is the complexity of building that square? Do we need 1,000 tiles? Do we need 1,000 squared tiles? Can we get by with a lot more than that? That's a question we want to ask. Yes? So this type of self-assembly is right now, um, I would call this algorithmic self-assembly, the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, extremely powerful in principle. As of yet, there's no current implementation that doesn't, ha that doesn't overcome 
you know, acceptable error rate where we could use it to build substantial things. So the, the hope is that the belief that this is going to be key in the future, but there's some key obstacles that need to come over before this can be used. But very powerful in principle. But right now, the type of self-assembly nanotechnology is being done is um, substantially less sophisticated in that the molecules really aren't doing any sophisticated computation to solve their problem. In principle, they can, and we know that they do by the fact that we all exist. So we're trying to harness that power, and it, it really doesn't, it, it's not, we haven't done it yet, but yeah. All right, so we want to build squares, rectangles. Now we're going to focus on building shapes. So let's focus now on rectangles, and we're going to start the simplest example. Okay. Now keep in mind that square. That's what we're going for, squares, how efficiently. But let's start with rectangles. Start with the simplest one, uh, a line, a one by n line. How efficiently can you build a 1 by 100 line? Anyone want to take a guess? Uh, well, <laughs> you only need n, OK? So you could use n distinct tiles, and it will grow exactly that n with a distinct glue. It will just count down the n tiles and then stop, OK? So you can achieve n. Now, can you beat n? Could you n minus 1 tiles to build a 1 by n line? Maybe n divided by 2. Any guesses? Well, if you could beat n, then since the length is n, you'd have to repeat, you have to reuse a tile, right? You, know, you can have n distinct tiles, so you'd have to repeat some one. If you even did one less than n, you'd have to repeat a tile. Now, if you think about the implications of repeating a tile A there, you placed A a first time, it had a red glue, and grew this gray chain, and then placed A again later. Well, what could have happened is that next A could have done the exact same thing over and over and over and again, and thus you, if you ever repeat a single tile, one possible thing that could happen is an infinite growth. And so you wouldn't satisfy the constraint of saying, I uniquely built this shape, because some growths would be arbitrarily long. Does that make sense? All right, so in fact, if you did even a tile less than n, you couldn't build n by n. So therefore, the true complexity n is exactly n. You can achieve n, and you can't beat it by even one tile. So we've solved the one by n line. It's very simple, just n tiles, and that's the best you can do. I asked herself, okay, let's, let's bump it up a little bit. A two by n rectangle, okay? So obviously, now you, just by the same reason you can, do, you can do two times n tiles, okay? A unique tile for every position. Do you think you can beat n tiles here? Well, obviously, you need n tiles, right? I mean, there's two copies of that one by n line, which you need n tiles. You probably need twice that many. Definitely, right? Obviously. But unfortunately, you know, we've got to prove this stuff, this laws of mathematics that make us write proofs. So we've got to prove that, but it's obvious you can't beat n. Um, but our argument, if, if you had fewer than n, you'd have to repeat a tile. Okay, so therefore you could pump this thing. The only thing is you haven't quite like blocked off the bottleneck of the shape. And you might say, well, is it possible that the first time I placed an A, I had a B below it, and the second time I put a C below it, and maybe somehow as they were growing, the fact that I placed the C the next time, am I out of time? Okay. Um, <laughs> that told me that I needed to stop. Maybe that's possible. Okay. And uh, in fact, that's the best thing we can prove is that you need, and you need distinct columns, and that gives us an order square at lower bound. Okay. So lower bound squared n, upper bound n, I think, ah, we weren't able to prove it. Turns out there's a reason we can't prove it, because you actually achieve square root n. It's actually tight. You can get square root n through kind of an interesting example. And just because we're out of time, I can't go over it. But we can just pair square root n tiles in the top row with square root n tiles in the bottom row to get n distinct columns with only square root n tiles and get exactly our length n shape. So we get a tight upper and lower bound for the rectangle, which is surprising. A bigger shape required needed fewer tiles to solve that shape. OK, so that's kind of interesting. And um, more generally, you can generalize this to a k by n rectangle and get k plus n to the 1 over k complexity, and not worry the details of that. And uh, some more fun details. Skip over those. We're running out of time. And um, yeah, upper and lower bound. At any rate, now squares. Real quick, want to build an n by n square. The way we did it here, 3 by 3 square, we built with n distinct tiles, we built up one axis. With n distinct tiles, we built the other axis. And then with one single filler tile, we filled in the rest. 
So this construction could be generalized to an n by n square to build n for one axis plus n for the other plus one more. We can build any n by n square in two n tiles. Yeah? By doing this, by doing this, n, another n, filler. Two n. We can always do that. Now, can we do better? Yeah. Build these two scaffoldings cheaper by building a fatter rectangle, just like we just did, a k by n rectangle, and then fill it in. And we can build a k by n rectangle by our algorithm we just showed in that complexity. So pick a k that minimizes that number. Turns out you get log n over log log n, which, like magic, is the information theoric lower bound. That's the best you could possibly do. It's kind of, whoa. That's, that's exactly the complexity of n by n squared. Log n over log n. Weird number, but the laws of nature said that is how efficiently you can build an n by n squared. And that is the summary. Okay, out of time. This is a picture of, uh, this is an AF image. This is a, actually a, a counter counting in binary on the right there uh, with DNA implemented tiles. And then there's a Sierpinski triangle built uh, in a sheet of DNA just to kind of show the power of these self assembly tiles. Okay, out of time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're completely dumb molecules. This is this self-assembly model is based purely on local interaction. As the tile's just dumbly floating around, it bumps into something and it either sticks or it doesn't. And that's its only interaction. It can't sense that over here something cool is going on. It just sees right next to me, I either stick or I don't. And that's that's all that drives this. And uh, you know, there's motivation that that's all you need. It's actually very powerful. Um, so you can do a complex computation. These, these tiles can actually simulate any computer program as they grow. They're, they're Turing universal, in fact. They're very powerful, but just with these local interactions. They don't see a distance, I guess. No. Yes? Yeah, um, so we didn't talk too much about in this particular example. Like We designed these systems so there's only one thing that could happen. But in a, lot of, in a lot of things you'd want to do and a lot of other models that you can formulate based on this, you might have like this guy could attach here or this different tile could attach here. And it's a, it's a probability distribution, which one goes. And actually you can do some really clever stuff by you know, uh, harnessing that power. In, like, so you could build a shape more efficiently if you allow random errors. And you can apply some, you know, like some probability arguments to say, you know, if I allow myself to build it with just 99.9% .9 chance, I can build it much more efficiently if then I insist 100% by, by relying on this, this probability, this randomness that's inherent in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Is this like a functional group or a chemistry? Um, unfortunately, your question has just exposed a gaping lack of knowledge of, of chemistry on my part. I don't know what a functional group is. Okay, um, I, I don't know. There may be some some uh, some connection there. That, also, yeah. do your algorithms uh, would they work in, uh, for inorganic molecules? Because I seem to recall back in the nineties, mm -hmm. uh, someone had developed a self-replicating molecule based on chlorine. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, for, so the answer is um, I don't know, but. Um, let me just say, why are we using DNA? And the reason is, uh, just to clarify in, in this question, it's like, um, we're not like interested really in understanding biology, although that is something that people are interested in, but that's not directly. The reason we're using DNA is because it's such an extremely predictable, predictable molecule. You synthesize a sequence of DNA, you synthesize this, another one over here, and this portion has one set of uh, bases, and over here, the watson crick complement of that, you throw in a test tube, with great reliability, they will find each other and lock in that exact position. So the ability to control how things self-assemble with DNA uh, is really great, and that's why it's being used as a, mole a molecule here. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically any type of molecule, inorganic, whatever, that has that kind of power um, is of interest. And, and you know, this model is very abstract. It could be, in principle, applied to other molecules. It's just you know, glues. However, those glues are implemented. Strands of DNA something else, you know, array of magnets. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Um, I'm not saying necessarily building organs, but uh, there's different, different motivations. So here's one motivation, okay? Um, let's say, so I, I mentioned that this model of self-assembly is computationally universal. In other words, you can take any computer algorithm, like an algorithm that um, takes as input some specifications of where to route airlines, of, of some constraints, and, and finds an optimal way to schedule these, these airlines around the country or ship some goods or something. In principle, you can take that, that input to that problem, encode it into a set of tiles, and then build them in DNA, throw them in a test tube, and they self-assemble a shape that tells you where to, send, where to send the truck, where to route the planes. Now, why, is, why might someone want to do that? It's like, you know, my computer probably solved that faster than these stupid DNA, especially the, the days you take building those things. Okay? Now, in principle, the thing is, in like just a little bit of DNA, it's so dense that there's so many molecules of DNA that can be packed in just like a little tiny drop. You could imagine a massively parallel computer where there's billions of these computers solving your computational problem, different instances of it, in parallel. So what you have potentially is like a billion core computer in a test tube, potentially faster than any current supercomputer. That's one potential motivation, okay? Um, other motivations, what I'm personally more interested in, is just the algorithmic manipulation of matter. Trying to understand that, trying to harness it to build things that we want. Um, one example would be, let's say we want to build a super small computer chip or circuit or narrow scale device or something. You know, we currently build chips with top down lithography. Okay, um, there's limits to how small we can make the components. And uh, it's a limit. there's some limits to how fast we can make them. In principle, what this does, instead of building a device from a top-down approach, we instead program some molecules to build, we, we describe to them what we want to build, and they algorithmically, by self-assembling, create that pattern for me. And then maybe these tiles have a, a fifth glue sticking up that you could attach a gold bead onto or something. And then maybe in this pattern you have a wire of a certain tile type with the gold bead, and then you heat it up and it melts it into a wire. Okay? And then maybe some other device create OR gates, AND gates. So basically you program molecules to build a circuit from the bottom up, maybe at a scale smaller than what you could do with top-down lithography. So build a smaller nanoscale device. And more than that, again, you have so many of these molecules that can be packed in such a small, dense area, you could, in principle, be designing billions of this device all in parallel. So this is potentially a scheme for the massive parallel fabrication of nanoscale devices. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so that's, that's some of the motivation. And I guess a third one is just kind of understanding the theory of self-assembly because it's so fundamental to how nature creates cool machines. So, yeah. Absolutely, 3D. So here I talked about you know, a 2D model, and that's just really because uh, for simplification, it's kind of hard to think about in 3D, I guess. And, and it's already quite powerful. It, it can, it's Turing universal even in 2D. But interesting things actually happen in 3D. And certainly if you're, say, building scaffolding to build a 3D structure, you need 3D tiles. And does that extend to say that you can use other shapes like honeycomb? Or down Absolutely. And people do exactly that. Yeah, so there's actually a bunch of different uh, primitive basic um, proposals for the, the DNA tile, triangular tile, a hexagon, a 3D thing. <laughs> yeah, so um, exactly. Yeah. Can Did you say that again? Self-assembly. Self-assembly. Ah, yeah. Access Absolutely. In the model I formulated, technically, I this, there's different models. This one was the idea of like a single tile attaching to a growing seed. But what you just described is another common model that's used in, in the area called the hierarchical or two-handed self-assembly model. That just, yeah, that does exactly what you said. You build something over here, it's this big, you build something over here, and then those two big things can come together in, in like that. Basically anything you can grab in one hand and put together, it's called two-handed. But yeah, yeah, so that's a, it's another model and uh, it has interesting differences from this single tile addition model and 
in, you know, in practice, things can come together like that. And so, yeah, so that is a very interesting direction for research. A great question, actually, yeah. Hmm. Last call. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.